thank you all very much for coming and for listening to a talk about dancing, um, which, as I mentioned, I, I'm probably as unaccustomed to giving as you are to hearing. But why not talk about dancing? It's, a, it's such a, a, a wonderful art and science and experience. And I thought, as you, oh, if I just chose to flip here. Oops, sorry, you, you missed me, my introduction there from Australia. And uh, director of the Earthly Delights Historic Dance Academy and also the founder of the band Earthly Delights and having been involved for many years. But I, I, I might indeed just tell you a little bit about my background before I go on to tell you about the latest big series of books that I've been working on for the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, of, which, of which we've got two uh, books in the series of 30 or 33 because it's just impossible for, for me to carry the series around the world. Um, but and it, it, uh, Sampo has a, a full set as of, this, that, as of early last year and that was an edition I finished 18 months ago and but I'm still I'm working on revisions and expansions so hopefully the final will be out in six months time. But to let you know my interest in historical dance started back in the 1980s when I was, just dancing, I was dancing with every group possible while doing postgraduate studies at the Australian National University in Canberra and while doing postdoctoral studies in the US. And it grew further in the 1990s when back in Canberra I enjoyed dance in ever more groups, starting to organise classes and balls of my own and started to compose my own tunes and dances in, in historical idioms. In about 2006, after a decade um, focused on shaping my Earthly Lights Bordonian collections and my Christmas Carol de collections, dance collections, I decided to put all my historical dance notes into order. Little did I know that I thought it would just be a small little process. <laughs> but of course, uh, then you decide, I want to fill out this corner of history and that corner of history, and you get interested in an, another subject and you want to know more about something else. And the more you know, the more you realise you don't know. And so, and what I thought might be one book on historical dancing turned in, as, as Sampo has experienced, into 33. I'm not going to get more, they're just going to get a little bit fuller. Uh, and 33 books, and that's what hopefully will appear at the end of this year. I needed to also collect more and think more because so much about dance reconstruction uh, and understanding dance is, a, is really about thinking because dance for me is really ideas. It's a whole ecology of ideas. And as we got going, my wife, Alwyn, was very busy uh, costuming all the band and willing displayers in all the different period costumes for the different balls that we started to run. We ran a different ball on a different historical theme every month for more years than I can remember. And we've only just started to break that pattern this year after, I don't know how, from <laughs> after years. And every month I was also preparing a whole new program of dance to fit a particular theme. And, and trying to teach a small group so that we could then make the ball move better for everybody. And being so far from North America and all the European dance teachers, I found myself reading all the primary sources. Uh, as I, when I travel around Europe, uh, and I, if I ask somebody uh, about their, how they got into dance or how they came up, how they came to interpret something in a particular way, they'll normally say it was because of my teacher taught me that way. And if I end up asking a teacher, they'll say, to my surprise sometimes, they'll say, oh, because of my teacher. So it sometimes becomes almost like folk dance. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't have the luxury of teachers <laughs> that you have, so I just went straight to the sources and my Source collection got larger and larger, originally facsimiles, uh, because this was in the days before the internet, almost, I'm afraid to say. There were those days. And then um, I ended up spending any free money our family had for 20 years on originals of antique dance books too. So I've probably got the largest collection, uh, well, certainly in the Southern Hemisphere, one of the largest in the world of dance books. Antique, now, I, I, it's a very bad habit, but I am trying to, I'm giving it up. <laughs> And I promised Alan a new life at the end of this year when I finished this collection of books. Uh, 
I never imagined, of course, it would become that big. But, and maybe I wouldn't have started if I had, but uh, I, I, would, I don't regret it. To look at those dance books, give you a little glimpse, I'll just give you the front covers that we put up 18 months ago uh, to announce just the first, that very first preliminary edition. You can see there's a, a book one, and that's the overview. And to tell you the truth, that's the volume that I'm having the most fun with at the moment, because it, it's, it's the one where I feel free to try to join the dots and try to trace out themes and look at ideas as they persist through 500 years of dance. And uh, whether it's ideas to do with mechanisms, to do ideas to storyline, so many different aspects, you can trace them from 1400, 1450, all the way through to 1900. But after that first volume, I also actually um, go back and try to look at dance before 1450, all the way back to the ancient Greeks, which took me into my original subject, which was classics and ancient history. So I was quite used to dealing with fragmentary material and making outlandish uh, propositions based on it. Um, then come, oh, sorry, then come, oh, you'll see below it three books, all volume one effectively, but it's in three books. And the first one of each volume is, uh, I call it Dance in General. And in that, I look at things, well, I'll show you a little slide beforehand. Then the second two are always dances in detail. They're the reconstruction. So for every time period, there's three volumes. Here's another three for uh, late middle Renaissance, uh, late Renaissance, uh, Cavalier sort of period, early Baroque, always three volumes for every period. And Sampo kindly brought two. I can just pass them around. Well, this was the first one, which looks at just dance in general and in any picture. And this one is, uh, that one is dance. If you just take them that way around, then they'll get the, the part one before they get the first part of part two, which I call 2A. And then the last two volumes, uh, uh, you'll see there at the bottom in black, I decided to, so that people didn't have to carry a whole library to a dance <laughs> or give a whole library to the musicians, I would just extract my summary, which appear at the beginning of every dance century, just a very brief cryptic summary of the dance and uh, just a very simple transcription for the music, leaving out all the other facsimiles of piano scores or lute tablatures and anything else which is in the full volume, but just something simple. So you end up getting, uh, oh, I, you end up having part one in, of each volume look, being broken into uh, four sections, part 1A on dance context, and I look at the evolution of the ball in all the different countries of, of relevance in that period in this Western European tradition that have the sources, because of course there's dance traditions persisting elsewhere where we just don't have the sources. Uh, dance forms, because dance forms have an evolution of their own, and you can trace them from one period to the next. Uh, uh, and indeed, periods end up falling away. I know when we're reenacting, we tend to think we're doing Renaissance, we're doing Cavalier or Baroque, but once you start getting into it, you realize they're just conveniences, shorthands. And so, uh, and I'm able in that dance form section to show the continuities, to talk back to the previous volume about what was, uh, and then talk forward to what's coming. <laughs> dance elements, I'd look at style, etiquette, honors. You'll notice in those books when they come around, that I always put in bold the original text. I know in academic articles you often have the original text in smaller italics, but I wanted to make these, put, put the primary sources up front. So anything that's in bold other than a heading is a primary text, and I do translate them, because that used to be my ancient history thing, translating from other languages all the time. So that was, uh, that was easy. Um, Dance teaching, I have a section on, on, oh, so in that dance elements section, there's sections on figures and steps as well, because there's a lot, generally a lot more we can glean about both of those than people commonly appreciate when you draw all the information possible together in any period. And indeed, when you start looking at other periods and letting them inform the period you're looking at. Uh, dance teaching, I have sections on the practice of being a dancing master. And in fact, at one stage, this book was going to be called something like Dance Dancers and Dancing Masters. I thought it had a nice 
bounce to it. <laughs> but I wasn't sure if people would get confused. Anyhow, I had it on one cover, which I took to a festival, and sure enough, a couple of, uh, at that same festival the next year, I somehow produced a book almost with the same name. They saw mine, I thought, oh, that's not. So I thought, anyhow, I'll make mine simpler. Um, dancing through the A's as it is. The part two books, there's always a part two A and a part two B. They're the dance reconstructions in detail, and each one will have a summary box. In fact, if I can <laughs> hold one up, the two A, yeah, can I just hold that up to show an example? Each one will have. Oh, here's a. Here, just at random. That's although that's quite a big. That's quite a big summary for a rather complicated dance. So one of them, a very popular dance in Regency times, because this one's from the middle of the series, uh, from. 18, covering 1800 to 1825, and there was a French dance that came across, La Batteuse. So I have a little summary. Often the summary is a lot shorter. Let's have a look here. Or Caledonian Quadrille, that's not going to be so much shorter. But a little country dance might have a very short box. Then some music. So all the musicians really need to see in the caller on stage is this and that. But I have a caution in the books. Do read the whole entry before using, before relying on the summary box. Because otherwise, I make the mistake too. I think I'll always remember the dance and I go to my own summary and I think, hmm, how did that go again? And so I'm, I'm but the more I use them, I've got my own copy of, uh, annotated because every time I use them, I will try to make it clearer. And I always try to do dances myself that I haven't done for a long time because it improves my summaries for people. And I was very pleased to see, Sampo, that one of those volumes was, um, had a bent cover because I want them to be used, so that's good. <laughs> and um, then I get into putting a box, I call it the reconstruction table, with the te original text in bold but my annotations in brackets. And I break down the text according to uh, the structure of the music. So. For, and the same here, although this is going to be a much longer, more involved dance because it's got a four or five extant te texts dealing with the same text. So I put them in parallel, you see? And then I underline the words that I believe can actually give you, provide you with calls. And they're the words in original text, so it can keep you faithful to the sources. And then at the end of every section of reconstruction table, whether it's long or short, I have notes. And and again, there's going to be text in bold because I'm quoting. Here I'm quoting from newspapers referring to the dance. There's always no end of different sources. Um, and in some texts, I'm quoting from court cases that refer to dances. <laughs> That's particularly useful because, uh, because in a court case, you're going to be doing the dance um, they're going to be, the person is going to be reporting what actually happened. Well, if they're honest. <laughs> uh, whereas often a dancing master is reporting what should happen, which might be different. And in literature, of course, you can have lots of references to dancers, but they might report what might happen, <laughs> which can be different again. Do you want to pass the, this one on to the second rank now? Or? Yeah. Don't, don't look too far because and if you find a mistake, you squiggle on it, okay? <laughs> and tell me. Because they're, not, they're the, unedit, the unimproved ones. I'll just flick on because I'd love to have a lot of discussion and show a lot of videos at the end here. See if I can manage this. The, let's look further at this process of dance reconstruction by starting with this issue of gathering sources. I always try to get every possible source together and then try to reconcile them into some sort of tabulation. And so they might match off against the music. But often you'll discover that you have uh, maybe two or three different versions of a dance circulating. And, and, and so I, in my books, might call one one, the next one two, and the other one might be a later version which ends up in another volume and is just cross-referenced. And then I'll put all the text to do with that one here and the other texts there. Um, and yes, and I also try to read the secondary literature, of course, but as I mentioned, living in Australia, um, away from, and in fact, uh, away from the teachers, I don't have the benefit of how other people might have danced it. I actually try to collect how, anything that people have written about a dance overseas. But a good thing is that I'm not burdened by 
how uh, other people's expectations and the dancers I'm le the dancers who we're offering the dance to don't have any preconception because they're, 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 um, they're carte blanche when it comes to the dance. So I can try any reconstruction. And I'm afraid to say, more often than not, my reconstruction, I think, uh, will differ and, and, uh, from things that are, uh, are very popularly circulating. Um, they will, because the popularly circulating ones tend to drift away from the sources. Now, it's not, they may have very well good reasons for doing so. The reasons might not always be passed on from, you know what I mean? So people end up doing something imagining that was what was done, even though they learnt it from someone who had very good reason for doing that differently, and uh, as we all, all do. And I like to identify problems and options for solutions. And um, that always involves lots of thinking about syntax and particular terms, choreographic complexities, but also thinking about the, uh, the words themselves and trying to understand the source's purpose, as I was saying about the, whether it's from a, the source is a court case or a piece of literature. Uh, or an author, or whether it's a little pocket book, you know, these little pocket books, which have to be very succinct, but you really get the feeling that is going to be used in a ballroom or at the back of a diary. Um, understanding the, the source's purpose. Yes, we're really talking about that now, aren't we? Um, so we've spoken about this issue of to what extent uh, the source is reporting what was done or what should be done or what might be done. We also have the question of uh, what the purpose, what the writer's purpose was. Was it simply to do a little note to themselves, to remind themselves of a dance? And there's lots of those in handwriting from the last 500 years. Or were they trying to clearly describe every step to someone who had no idea? And, how do, and so sometimes you've got to factor this into your own reconstruction. Uh, because if they're just trying to give a little hint, you, they, you have the liberty to make some more judgments, maybe. How did this description come about? What were the stages and the hands through which a work passed between purported and supposed originator and the manifestation we have? In the work, was, uh, if the work was not by the originator of the dance, but penned or engraved or printed by someone else, how confident can we be that the origin of the originator's intention um, or of the living pract uh, uh, that the dance can we be, that the originator's intention or a living tradition's practice is fully reflected in the source. And what was the purpose of the dance being explained? Is the text describing the dance as it was used in a social situation or a more theatrical situation? And if the former, if it was social, was it intended to be for general social use or a more limited sort of social use, like a dancing master's end of term party? Um, and if it was the Latter, the theatre, was it intended to be performed on stage or was it a th intended to be a theatrical performance that was performed in the middle of a ball room on the floor with the people around? So these can help you when you approach your reconstruction as to what bits you want to put in and what bits you want to leave out. If you want to capture the, what you think was the dancer's original purpose and the, the notator's original intention. And what insights can pictorial depictions offer? I collect lots of pictures on dance, everything I can, and they often offer lots of interesting information about hand holes and, and attitude, heights of knees, everything. But you've always got to be careful because pictures can just be copied from one situation to another. I have dozens of instances where the f same picture will be put in a completely different context. So you've got to be careful not to interpret that as it, informing so well that particular dance. And then you've got to, and how about understanding the dancer's context and function? Oopsie daisy. There we go. Um, every ball is made up of lots of different kinds of dancers performing different social functions. And every dance is made up of many elements and dimensions, like figures and forms and mechanisms and orientations and storylines. And every one of these elements in every dance uh, is the product of layers of ideas washing over each other over the centuries and influenced by fashions. And these washes this way and that way over each other can change, uh, not just between fashions, but between milieu, socioeconomic situation, uh, geographic location, even within the same city between different 
dance scenes or dancing masters halls. And a dance will change as it goes up and down the social milieus and as it travels horizontally and as it travels socially between village and country and town and court and then back between from court to town to village. Uh, and so you've got all of these dynamics at play as well when you are trying to capture, when you're trying to reconstruct a dance. So it's necessary to ask, what is the dance in question's purpose and its associations? Do you imagine what is being described or notated was intended to be in one, this context or that context, a, a virtuosa theatrical performance or, a, um, or a, a, a really lively end of evening casual dance party? And does a dance have a particular as association with a particular level of formality or, um, or nationality even. And that can bring in the question of whether it has any cultural or political whether, um, associations and whether it's actually intended to make a statement. There's lots of dances that are intended to project a particular uh, national or cu cultural um, into, the, into a, another arena. You know, for example, Besada, the, the, that Czech dance quadrille from the mid 19th century, was putting a whole lot of Czech dance steps and rhythms into the French quadrille form, and it was published in Czech and French simultaneously. And it was sort of telling and sent to Paris as well as Prague, and it was trying to tell people that we have our Czech culture and it can uh, sit just as well with the, with the dominant French dance culture of the time. And, and you have politics at play in Poland, for example, um, earlier on, uh, 50 years, 60 years earlier, when they're being sort of divided between Austria and, and Russia and Saxony. Uh, what you do on the ballroom floor, what dance you choose and which order you put them and, which, and how many of which dances you do can make a political statement. Um, and you can get into trouble if you make a statement too much one way when there's some dignitary from uh, uh, the, the country who's feeling offended. And, and, people, and you, you read about these things. You read about people being, um, being criticized for that, putting on a particular dance at a particular ball because of its connotations. Understanding dance form. This understanding dance form evolution, I, I feel, is very helpful because otherwise you can produce something which works as a dance and can be very entertaining and might just suit your purpose perfectly, but uh, will be out of the evolution that was, was happening at the time. Because in, there is an a, a, a evolution happening at many different levels. There's the one which just involves, you know, from the earliest times you could really think of all of our dance just evolving out of basic imperatives. Uh, the man had the woman on his right hand side so he could lead her. And that gives rise, of course, um, that gives rise to, we well, had her on the right and he wanted to lead her. So if you have a lady on the man's right and you want to lead her, when you go in a circle, you're going to go to the left. When you go around the room, you're going to go, so that to the left is clockwise. When you go around the room, you're going to go anti-clockwise, because the lady that then is on the outside, she has further to go, so there's a little bit of a tension, you see, and so the man has the sense of leading her, which was just one of those underlining imperatives that gave rise to all of these different uh, dance forms that we have. And uh, spatial constraints, fitting the dance into rectangular spaces, exhibiting courteous behavior, um, borrowing and adopting dances of others, and creating something new. These were all imperatives that are at play in the dance tradition, as well as simply wanting to have physical pleasure, and that's never far from, uh, far from at work. Uh, and beyond these basic imperatives, other ideas, many based in storytelling, started to take hold, and out of the, these, thousands of dancers eventually evolved. But they tend to be in forms and can be seen to be of no more than about far, about eight or nine types, all of his myriad of dances. There's follow the leader circle dance forms, and that would take in things like the carol and Brahms to the gavotte and the farandole. Processional couples dances from Bassa dance to Pavan to Almain to Lake Courants and, and Polonaise. Uh, the facing couples dance, uh, which takes in the, 
Italian ballet, two-person dances, cascada, to the minuet, and to cut-in jigs from the 19th century. There is just so much commonality across those. Uh, the playful dance um, with competition, so uh, that in, that's takes in all those relay mixes to cotillion dance games to early courants. You have the whole set long ways finishing dance. That's when you're not in minor sets, but it's the top couple will end up at the bottom after each sequence. And you have those in from Kirantana to Sir Roger to Coverley to your porno polka, I believe, which I've, <laughs> I've, been, I've been told about, but I'm yet to dance fully. <laughs> and I think it's very similar to one we have. And it actually it serves the same function, I think. A good end of evening dance. I bet you put it late in the evening. You wouldn't start with it, would you? Sounds too, too gutsy. Every part. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> I tell a Please. story when I was in a SCA year, well, 1998, and Porno was created uh, at those times. And I met a person who was in SCA with me that time, who is like my age at the moment. Yeah. Well, we've seen all the Borna Polka dancing at Tropecon, and she said, we didn't know the monster we created. <laughs> you didn't know? What was that, sorry? The monster they created. Oh, yes, yes. Well, that's right. The, I mean, it's the SCA. It's the creative parts in there, isn't it? There has to be more and more people every year dancing, so you can go through the hall without getting into the Borna Polka dance. Yes, and pulls you in. right. Yeah. And, so, and we have something serving exactly the same function at home. Um, the square set dance tradition, and that takes in things like the cotillon and the contradance francais, the potpourri cotillion, the deux, the quadrille. The turning, cup, the turning dances, uh, you've got the enigmatic peasant German dance you'll see in the Bruegel paintings and Beham woodcuts, and you've got La Volta, the Allemande of the 18th century, which evolved into the waltzes and the uh, mazurka, gallop, polka, all of these, shotish and beyond. And then you've got the high, there's eight categories. Nearly everything fits into those categories. And if you want another category, you can call it the long way square couples dance hybrids because in the 19th century, a lot of those last categories just hybridized. So you get, uh, well, actually it started before the 19th century, you get minuet waltzes, I th uh, I'm sorry, minuet country dances, I think you did, and you get, um, you'll get mazurka square dances, mazurka quadrilles. So out of all of these dance forms, and that, um, helping to under, knowing, these, knowing these forms, or having them in mind, when you come to reconstruct a dance can be very helpful because when a dance is very cryptically described and it's hard to work out how it goes, you can just step back a little bit and think, oh my gosh, this dance is of such and such a form. And then you can bring into your mind other dances of that form from a century earlier and a century later, and it can help you solve problems. And I found that possible with a lot of dances that people just don't look at. Um, Malgraziosa uh, in, in the sixth, in 15th century Italian uh, dance language, da dance repertoire. Um, I can't think quickly of others, but so many times you just have to look to the century earlier or later. Or the Congo minuet in the late 18th century. People just are unsure how they go. But they are in a very strong tradition, which if you look 100 years before or later, you can find analogous dances that can help you reconstruct the text you have. Um, and the other way, the other important thing I think to understand before I, we show some pictures and, and ask for some uh, questions and comments and, and come to our last point, is understanding storyline. As with uh, recognizing general dance type, recognizing storyline type can also help to find analogous dances from other places and periods, which in turn can help us with dance reconstructions. Humans like stories. If humans can find a storyline in an ex anticipated task or in an, accept an actual experience, it makes the task easier to navigate, to enjoy, and to remember, and to share. Today we expect to learn a story, we, sorry, to, today we expect to discern a story in a theatrical stage show. We just expect that in a ballet. But it was in most participatory dance for 500 years. Uh, dancing masters understood that dancers had storylines. Um, thus, in the 15th century, in 15th century Italy, many will know, Antonio Cornizano wrote 
that he was intending to tell contrasting stories in his dance Mercantia and his dance Sobria, one about being promiscuous, one about being uh, sober and restrained. And, in eight, and hundreds of years later, in 1802, the Boston dancing master Saltator wrote that country dance, that, a country, that country dance, quote, figures ought to be images or representations of the subject of the tune, end quote. But he regretted that increasingly in his day, quote, either from want of consideration or from want of imagination or taste in those who have composed them, they are merely unmeaning tracks formed at random. So he was not impressed about how well people in 1802 were managing to capture story in their dances. But still it persisted in 1812. We have the Scottish dancing masters, Robert and Joseph Lowe, observing that Sir Roger de Coverley, which is, has a, is in this porno polka, strip the willow sort of family, but it has corner stealing. It, they finish with the stripping figure, but they have corner stealing to start with, or the top man introducing himself to the bottom lady, and then the, this top lady introducing, interacting with the bottom man before you all do the stripping. And those introductions, you'll find in different books that figures put in different orders by different people. And he put them in two completely different orders. And he, and he said... Um, if you finish, if you start with just the one that will meet, and then you go into the right and the left-hand turn, and then you finish with the two-hand turn, he, sa he, he, was a, he said that this, quote, implies, uh, whoops, sorry, um, this uh, implies if you, uh, an advance to the familiar. But if you go the other way from the two-hand turn and then you finish with the bow, it implies breaking off a of familiar acquaintance, you see? So a completely different story. So it's something to be sensitive to when you're reconstructing or maybe you have to insert an extra figure. And sometimes I, I, I see dancers and I see this, I, I know the dance and I'll see people dancing it in a slightly different form. I don't know why they might have arrived at that form. They've combined, I can see that they combined a few different sources, but sometimes they will miss that possibility of a, pro a, a procession from, and normally the procession is from the unfamiliar to the familiar. And other people wrote too. Oh, in Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, uh, Kath Catherine Morland's clever dancing party, Mr. Tilney, he declared, I consider a country dance as an emblem of marriage. Fidelity and compliance are the principal duties of both, and those men who do not choose to dance or marry themselves have no business with, their part with the partner or wives of their neighbours. <laughs> and, and when he was challenged, that no, no, it can't be anything to do with marriage, he said, no, no. You will allow. In both, the man has, has the advantage of choice. The woman only the power of refusal. And in both, it is an engagement between a man and a woman formed for the advantage of each. And that when once entered into, they belong exclusively to each other until the moment of his dissolution. That is their, their duty, each to endeavor to give the other no cause for wishing that he or she had bestowed themselves elsewhere. And their best interest to keep their own imaginations from wandering toward the perfections of their neighbors, or fancying that they should have been better off with, uh, with anyone else. So he saw this need to, uh, this connection between the dance and, and, uh, and marriage. And other people see a general connection between dance and life. People are writing poems about the quadrille later on. And someone wrote this poem which included, which finished with the line, dance prettily la pastorelle. That's a figure which involves a man flirting with two ladies. So it's the courting phase of life. And if you find, and if you find the net will, will hit, in other words, if you actually do find that you've got a good partner that, that you, you uh, have captured. Um, venture en avant deux, that's one of the calls in the dance for life. In other words, pair off for life, and you do pair off in this, and let la grande chaine finish it. That's the big mixture, so it's sort of like a celebration. And so you find dance uh, storylines suggested in dance titles, in figures, in gestures, in the order in which you find the figures, and in the music. Um, there's so many ways, but I, I do want to make sure I have time for questions and videos, so I'll, I'll be careful. Um, this, this progression of figure order, 
You saw it with that Scotsman talking about the progression in the, the Saroja de Coverley. But you'll also find it when you have a medley of dances that is accepted. You'll find the first dance in the medley is normally the simplest, and then the more challenging, and then something fancy at the end. And you'll find that in historical sources. And you probably do it yourself if you're putting a medley together for a display, or if you're working out a dance program. But um, you like to have this little progression. Well, in a dance program overall, of course, you want to have little waves of building up and then relaxing again and building up. But over a whole program as a whole, you will also have uh, a structure that will go from, general, historically, will go from the most formal dances, opening dances, whether it's a pavan in the Renaissance or a minuet in, uh, in, in the Baroque era or a polonaise in the later era. And then you'll get into the more popular dances of the day, uh, the fashionable dances that you want to show off. For, and, and all the young people will really enjoy. And then at the end of the evening, you have a phase which normally includes the timeless dances that have been lasting for 500 years just in different music. And you'll find this all the time in, when you look at dance programs, and even when you look at dancing masters' books. They will often put at the end of their book, and you can look at Caruso or Negri from circa 1600, end of their book, they've got the end of evening dances, because they refer to them in other contexts as being done at the end of evenings, or in, and, and they involve mixing, the dances which involve mixing of partners, promiscuity, always at the end, and where you get to meet everybody. And, and, so, so, and even with Foyer's uh, book in 1700 on contra dances, uh, at the end, he puts one which involves mixing. So it's all the time. And this reflects, in a way, what's happening in balls as well. Um, and it ha reflects also what's happening in a small way inside the dance. People are unconscious of it. But a dance normally starts, uh, normally, <laughs> um, will often start just orienting the dancers and the couples. So if you take a, if you take a typical uh, Playford type of dance, dance from late 17th century England, it will start with an up and back or, or going around in a circle. It's just orienting people. You can trace the origin of that back a hundred of years to when the, the cohort of dancers is going forward around the room. And now it's just reduced to just going forward and back, but it's still a presentation to the, to the your co company. And then the next figure might just be this shoulder siding figure. And that's sort of just getting to know that person. And that will, that will always come before giving arms, won't it? And the arms is when you're actually making contact. And in other dance traditions, they'll go further. And the arms are followed by two-hand turn. And if in an English country dance, you have a hay, a weavy figure, invariably, that is at the end of a section. That's a remnant, and that's the same when you go back to Italian dancing 100, 200 years earlier, and it's the same when you go forward a couple of hundred years. The weavy dance represents communal, everybody happy, just like they said here, Le Chant Grand uh, will finish it. That big chain uh, is sort of like the culmination. You've got, you've presented it yourselves in society, you've made your, you've courted and won, or you've made your friends here, and you're with increasing intimacy, from eyes to arm to hands, and now you're all enjoying life together as a big community. Um, so sometimes you don't actually have to put a lot of acting into a dance. Uh, you can just let the dance speak for itself. In fact, there's a, a Spanish dancing master who says in taking hands in the minuet, take the right hand a low, take the left hand a bit higher, and the two hands higher still. So you've got a projection, you see. So if, even without doing lots of flourishing or bringing in any comic routine to make the dance more accessible to an audience or more fun for the participants, you can just invite participants to uh, make something out of the natural storyline that exists in 500 years of dance by developing it. Same with a, a simple country dance. That, opening section, you can invite dancers to do it slightly more formally, you know, with double steps or something. But by the time you get to the, the chaining at the end, you can invite them to skip, you see. And there, all of a sudden, you have a story um, without having to have pantomime. And sometimes the story is not, uh, sometimes it's so unconscious that even publishers 
uh, who put together books of music and dance uh, just in order to get sales. They know that this tune is now really popular, so they'll write a dance themselves or get someone just to write a dance. And sometimes they'll just copy a dance figure from another dance that doesn't fit just to put underneath the tune so they can sell a new book of tune with, tunes with dancers. Even when they put those dance descriptions down that you know are not really tailor-made or, or really are they're very cliched, not very inventive, but even those ones have this same language. They cannot avoid it. Everyone just does it automatically. Um, and in fact, on the way here, we were talking the other just uh, after one of these cl classes about uh, Halloween. That's right, you had your Bordonian Halloween party. And someone was saying how maybe we need horror dancers for a Halloween party. And then we were speculating what would make a horror dance. And of course, the first two things that came to mind in the conversation in the group was something so slow, right? That would be horrific. <laughs> Um, another thing, of course, would be something that is so repetitive. Circle, circle again. Circle again. But I thought what would be a real horror to me would be a dance that had the figures in orders that were not intuitive. So you circled, you know, you circled right before you circled left, or you gave a left hand before you gave a right hand, or you know, or you did something that seemed like an introduction later on. <laughs> That, that would be a different sort of horror, wouldn't it? You see, and you don't think of these things. Um, I, ha I'm, I'm, I guess a little bit more on, oh yes, here's one uh, funny gentleman that saw. You have time. We have time. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, Sampa. I will look at my notes then. Um, ballroom dancers invariably took their storyline themes from the main business of the ball. And this is interesting uh, because you start to see that, as I've been saying, there's story in dance. I'm leaving out the hundreds of examples I could, but they'll all be in that volume one, which overviews uh, dance, the nature of dance, the gives the natural history of our dance traditions. But the interesting thing is, you have the stories in the dance, but you also have a story in the ball, what, the, what is happening in the ball and what the ball represents. And there's an, there's an equivalence between them. So the dan each dance ends up being a little bit like a microcosm of what the ball is about. And this uh, satirical writer in England in 1865, R.S. Surti, said, the main business of a ball was, quote, to find a wife, to look after a wife, or to look after someone else's wife. <laughs> and, that goes a long way, actually, over the centuries. I, I, to, with, with respect to find a wife, uh, you have dancers. Uh, now, I, if people want the examples, we can speak later. Or, but I think you would know some of them. Like playing coy, that playing coy theme that you see in oh, Mal Graziosa. The other one which people don't look at is Our Julius Measure, an English Almain, which has that playing coy idea, and new bow peep, and, and, and sobria, and um, and Blazers' new set of quadrilles from the 1830s. You have teasing and flirting theme, linking dances like Gelosia and Mercantia, all the way linking them with dances like the Bork and Marzette's Number One and Boulanger and things like this many centuries later, and Cheat the Lady and the Coquette. Um, and you have the chase and catch theme from 16th dance century catchier dances linking all the way through to um, the Galapade quadrille that we're going to do this afternoon in the historical dance workshop. The juggling of two choices theme, linking lots of dances. You can see it in La Vita di Colina and Volta Tazzi in Saracena, and you can see it in the Scotch Reel um, uh, from many centuries later. And Dashing White Sergeant today, if there's any Scottish country dancers here. Man between two women, you pay attention to this one, you turn them, right ha you, right, you set right hand, pay attention to this woman, you set left hand, and then you juggle them, you see? This is all finding a wife, I call it a theme, as, you, as Surtez put it. You have the courtship theme, which we had a look at in that dance uh, the other, on Wednesday, La Bourre Assis Passage, where the man takes the lady out, puts her above, goes back, and then they look at each other, they do a little figures to check each other out, then they finally give right hand, left hand, and finish with two hands. And you see that in earlier dances, earlier Italian ballets, like 
Beletsa d'Olimpia has almost all the same elements. You see it in the later menuet à deux, the standard minuet from the 18th century. And you see it in the 19th century Congo minuet, which you might not be familiar with, but is a fantastic way to enjoy minuets in to jigs and real music, which took off for a moment. Um, and you see short forms of that courtship story in lots of other dances. And with respect to looking after a wife, uh, you have lots of dances which are sort of like, uh, are meant to suggest some uh, close relationship already because there's lots of arguing. <laughs> um, and some of them are, have arguments followed by reconciliation. You know these dances with the pointing of fingers and tweaking of ears. You've got them in the folk repertoire and they found their way into the ballroom. There's a whole genre of dances I haven't dealt with, which is possibly outside this definition because it comes from a, an earlier, uh, an earlier um, interest, and that's tournament dances, battle dances. There was a long history of mimed combat in dance, all the way back to the Greek world and probably earlier. And you see that in play in, in dance, in little pantomime dances like Les Bouffons, which our Beau describes as a sword dance. But you'll see it stylized into dances as well, where it's linked with gender arguing or competition. Um, and so you'll have Torneo Amoroso with clapping. Barriera is particularly interesting if you know about uh, Italian Renaissance dance because Barriera, you've got four people and you actually fight with three of them. <laughs> and so it's not really the wife, uh, I've gone off the tr wife track, I guess, because, but that is actually very interesting because there was a tradition of pageant combat dances that persist, that seems to, whether, which we know of in ancient Greek world, they'll talk about uh, groups getting into three different groups and then having a, a with music and having a, a stylized combat and it would be each group on the other. And that, those sources were known to people in uh, 16th century France who seem to be reenacting them almost. And we have records of pageants in Lyon and records of pageants in Italy, which are almost the same. Even the color of the, the dress of the plumes that the soldiers should wear are the same as in one of the ancient Greek sources. So they're obviously trying to reenact. And at the same time, they put that idea into their social dances, but they made it more battle of the sexes. Um, yes? Yes, I just understood that we actually have, have had this, this Flirting and courting and uh, things, uh, maybe unconsciously, because our first Valentine ball in uh, 14 was it uh, 2014. We had this uh, the the sets where the, the first one was like finding someone and courting, and then there was marriage, and then there was love, wow. and then there was argument, and then there was sadness. wow. Well, they, <laughs> there you go, there you go. That's uh, that, you think that was unconscious, do you? you that, well, how about that? And hopefully there was reconciliation at the end. <laughs> I still remember sadness. <laughs> there's, there's that, and that third aspect of looking after someone else's wife, there's, there's lots of dances like that. Um, you're not, uh, whether that's, whether it's, but there's, there's a narrow line between looking after someone else's wife and courting. Well, not really, because in this one you get into trouble, don't you? Um, <laughs> this one, you're like, there's dances where you'll go and steal a corner, you see, but you you come back to your partner, tut, 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 sort of thing. And there's lots of dances like that. And they last. So if you look at an English country dance like Paul's Steeple, a lot of people, not, not many people do it, because it's a little bit hard to understand. But if you look at it, it's just in just duple minor, and then you know a hundred years later there's this big tradition of triumph dances where you have a, a, um, a man between two ladies with, and they're making an arc over you, or a lady between two men making an arc. You realize that that's what's happening in Paul's steeple. So just seeing these continuities and in, the, in these scenes can help you reconstruct dances that you might otherwise miss. Um, there's lots of those corner stealing dances. Uh, um, Jealousia is a bit like that. Lightly love, old man is a bed full of bone stains, Morris, the black dance from England, the galopade from early 19th century France, and that's Sir Roger de Coverley we were speaking about.
So central is storyline to ballroom dances that a failure today to appreciate it can mean missing the connections between dances in different periods, miss the, and also miss the essential simplicity of some dances and produce a more complicated than need be and perhaps a less enjoyable than need be dance reconstruction. Not every dance, however, can be expected to tell a story of which ballgoers at the time were conscious. Often storylines survive only as uh, a fragmented echo of an earlier intention or as an unconscious propensity to use certain motifs or orders. And that comes back to that inter people internalized the expectation and so it became manifest even when you weren't aware of it. And I'm sure uh, you'd, you can, you'd be... It, appreciate that. Let's have a quick look at some storylines. I put some slides here. Let's hopefully they pop up. Oh yes, here's an example. You don't often get the storyline made evident in visually, but I just, before I came here, I took a receipt of some new music because I collect uh, music folios as well as dance books. And on the cover was was this beautiful picture and the dance which the music was for is the Lancers Quadrille. I'm not sure if you know that one. It's, uh, it's very well known in England as, a, as one of the most popular 19th century dancers and in Australia and North America. However, by the time you get to, the, there's a figure in it where um, you set the, the column, the square turns into a column and then the men all are on one side and the ladies on the other, and you chasse past each other. One, two, three, four, like this. Then you balance in and out and chasse back. Two, three, four, and balance in and out, and then you cast off. In the 1890s, I found Australian versions and I found an American version of the Lancers, and that's normally the very last figure, that chasse, because it's the culmination of the charging, like the cavalry, that they've just been seeing happening all around Europe, because that's when the dance dates to. That's not there. And in fact, I went to a ball in a regional Australia many years ago, and it wasn't there either. The whole dance happened, all the different figures, and then they all lined up, and they all went back to the square without doing the charging. And that was because they're an older generation and they didn't like to slip step, you see? So that fell away. And that's a, uh, a good reason. I'm, I'm assuming that's the reason. But in doing so, they actually they, they lost the meaning of the, in the, that's conveyed in the title of the dance, the Lancers, or Les Lanciers, because it was probably from that figure, it's little figure was from France. But you can, and you can see how important the lancing is when you look at this picture. Uh, it might be fantasiful, it might be just the uh, artist's uh, imagination, but the ladies are all holding Uhlans, the Polish cavalry lance, you see? as if they're going to lance their partner. And in fact, and, and it's just coincidental that when I, when I invite people, there are dances like Black Nag, where you, you gallop across on the corners and things, uh, which I find a remnant of the tourna tournament dance. And there's a, I will invite people to imagine they've got a shield and imagine they've got a lance. And in the lances, when you charge across, I'll invite people to imagine they're charging. Well, here they obviously enjoyed imagining the same thing because they're holding a spear. Or at least the artist is enjoying um, communicating with the, re the music readers and saying, we all know that this is about cavalry charging. Here's another one. This is from a, a, a wall tapestry in, in, a, in a Swedish castle, and it's based on Zebald Beham woodblock figures from the early 1500s. You've seen these pictures of everyone dancing in villages and things. And he's put them there, but look here. Uh, from left, the couple is just coming out with the hands down low. Then the second figure, the arms a little higher. The third figure, the ladies twirling under. And the fourth figure, they're embraced. Oh, and come out here and we'll show that. I haven't got my dance shoes, and we're not going to dance it. We don't know what music or steps they were doing. But you see, the first figure is like this, the manly. The next one, the hands coming up. The next one, the ladies going under that way. And then the last one, they're like this, all embraced. And there's an increasing intimacy just in, in those four pictures. So there's an increasing intimacy just between those four pictures, and they're telling the story of the dance. There's no point in the... There is a, no 
place in the mo no moment in the dance where you will necessarily see four people in a row looking like that. They're trying to capture time in one picture, you see. And ditto here. This is from Thomas Wilson's description of the waltz from 1816. Uh, he can't, artists uh, want to capture, can only capture one moment, so they sometimes try to put overlapping moments in a picture. And here, again, it tells a story from uh, the simplest on, I think, I, have I got a cursor? Yes, here we have a simple hold, and that was, in his text, was accompanied by a slow walk, and the, te the images go this way around in numbering, okay? And so I'll show you with Alan again. Could I show you, Alan? So this first one, he, did, he, put, he said you just walk out one step above, oh, so put, yes? One, two, three, two, two, three, three. And then you can start waltzing out. One, two, three, two, three. Doesn't matter. You're the picture. Then you can turn the lady over. And then what have we got next? You can go into, uh, oh, you can go into this hold. Sorry, I should, have, I should have left that on top. And I could have turned her that way. Oh, no, I'll do it the other way. I'll do it as I was to do before. You can do it this way. And then leave this hand. Well, there's lots of ways you can do it. And we, oh, I've changed hands. And then you can put both hands, uh, you can put that, drop that to there, I can drop this to here. We can do so many figures, you can take these and put them both here and waltzing on. Boom, 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 boom. And then you can, oh you can tumble, there's no tumble there. Uh, that's this one here. And then you can go in here and the steps can be faster and faster. And then eventually you can take the lady up and turn her under. So there's a little story just in the sequence the dancing master put together. A story, once again, in the sequence the dancing master did. Um, let's have a look here. Oh, oh, here's a little. This, this is better than us trying there. Here's a little bit. This is not the same, but Alan and has, has just very kindly gone. We are very bad at videoing anything we've done for the last 20 years. There's lots of bits in lots of different places, and I, neither of us had any real interest, and I have no competency at all in what to do with all these bits. But Alan, very quickly, the last 24 hours, has been trying to find different bits. This was something that was taken when we were in America teaching a waltz workshop, and... Um, I'll, I'll just show it as a little, it's not really telling a story, but it shows you some of those holes. Oh, no. oh something's happening. But even, I put these figures together myself, so they're Bordonian figures, I'm afraid. But they, um, once again, we try to start off simply, and then we get more knotty later on. I can go forward without ruining it. Can we jump forward? Oh, I see. I moved that. Car. And that's. How do I jump? I just hit. I just clicked to a new point. And so we're getting a bit more intimate. And then I don't know what we're going into now. I'm I was teaching all of these variants, so it becomes a bit like a Lendler. And it's the same with, if I can jump to the next slide, and now we're into one of those cosier holes. I don't normally dance to that music, but I, like, I thought Americans like things slow. <laughs> so I chose a slow, a slow track. <laughs> so we did it very slow. Here we go. I hit this one for the next video. Yes. And now it's relevance to northwestern Norway. <laughs> I think, yeah, we're doing that. Now, I'm going to shortly ask for a lot of questions before we come on to what is probably the most important element of my talk, just to finish off with shortly. Oh, but actually, before we do, I think we'll just skip back to the uh, master chart there. I won't show any more videos of ourselves because I want to show. 
Um, well, has it, has anybody got any while well, they're getting us back? Has anybody got any questions at the as, at the moment? Any thoughts that have come to mind about the okay. the the purpose? Sorry, the issue the issue of either of reconstructing dancers. Well, I would be interested to hear about this uh, these storylines. Like, how do you see uh, like differences between different countries from which you have uh, done reconstruction? Do you think? There is like, uh, is something more typical to France or to oh, Japan or Italy? That is an interesting <laughs> question, and I have not thought about that. Um, I, I would suspect we would find that the, the same essential, uh, you can define half a dozen recurring storylines, or maybe a dozen. Um, I, would, I would suspect you will find them all in every repertoire in any different geographic area. Uh, but it could be that there's a propensity of some in some areas, some in others. Uh, there's certainly a propensity of, of more at different points in the ball than others, as we were talking. Um, the more the, the promiscuous ones that involve, even though it might be uh, the promiscuous ones that involve stealing partners, normally are late in the evening. <laughs> We can say that with pretty strong certainty. Um, the ones that are more on the spot, which don't involve courting, courting can come first or second. Those courting things, because sometimes, like the most, the most, the courting dance par excellence, the minuet, is often second. I said it was first, but sometimes you'll start in a Versailles ball, everybody all together in a branle. So it's more a communal thing to start. And then you go into the, the couple after couple in order of importance <laughs> until, that, that court, until the dance escaped from that court and became a dance for everyone in Europe. Then everybody was on the floor doing it. So you've got, and you all just find your little patch of ground and you're all doing that dance. So it's changed from being a display almost to being a, just a general participation. I think in, 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 uh, in the islands, Swedish-speaking island areas of Finland, I believe there's a, a folk minuet um, where everyone gets into lines and basically does the essential minuet figures. Yeah. Um, but I will, I will be sensitive to that if I, as, I, as I continue to think whether there's differences. Maybe the, the, one of the big problems will be is that we don't know enough I mean, we know a lot when you bring all the sources you can into bear on, on your thinking, but we don't know enough to really to judge if there's a general character this way or that way in any particular country. Um, and also, we've also got to bear in mind, not everything is looking for, looking after, or, or et cetera, a wife, because there are these other more underlying dances, uh, choral traditions and combat traditions that sometimes come into it as well. But in the... But I'll think of that. Any other thoughts or questions before I, please, uh, on the on the subject of uh, any of those things that you might want to think about when reconstructing a dance. In that case, but while you're thinking, and before we come to the the big issue. Oh, if I come back to our chart, that's what I was aiming for. Sample. Our chart. We're going to f sh show now some videos of some balls that we've recently given. And these ball, before we talk about your purpose in reconstructing a dance, which is just so important, uh, thank you very much. We should be able to find it there, that, I think. Uh, are your videos here, Alwyn? They were below. What's they're below. Excellent. Thank you. Understanding our purpose. When we come to reconstruct a dance, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about this actually maybe after we've looked at these videos, so it's the last thing that you have in your mind when you go away. Um, so before we do, let's have a look at some dancing we've been doing in Canberra. As I said, we've been doing dancing for 20 plus years and hardly got a, a decent video. But a gentleman did some kind videoing of our last festival, which was in April, and we put three dancers on in a row. Uh, on the first evening, uh, it's actually under the banner of Jane Austen Festival Australia. But uh, that's because we started doing, as I said, a different historical ball every month. And, and we continue to do that for 20 plus years. But the one in April, we had traditionally a Jane Austen theme and it became bigger and bigger. 
People came from everywhere to do the Jane Austen theme. And I initially just kept, want, because I wanted to have people learn something as well as enjoy it, I, I kept to dances just from Jane Austen's period. But people would come and say, oh, can we do this dance or that dance? And they're from different periods. So I was reluctant at first to put them on the ball night, but we decided that uh, the Friday before the ball, we had a, a dance which one was for English dancers from before Jane Austen's day. And then we invented and eventually started having a Sunday, which was for dancers after Jane Austen's period, Victorian era ball. So we had three different period balls in one long weekend. And, this, and we are sort of giving that a little rest after 20 years, I think, <laughs> now, or an enormous number of years. This year, we're not having the three balls, we've decided, this coming year. But there's a bit of a, uh, a, a, a demand from people for us to get back into that big hall. And so we say, 2000 and 21. Next year we're going to have a smaller one at a, at a, a wool shed, which is right near our home. It's a beautiful old-fashioned Australian wool shed with a beautiful floor for dancing. But uh, here, here are our, is our first night's ball, just a little glimpse of it. And, uh, and of course, um, well, maybe actually before I show it, I might talk about the purpose because then, and we'll finish with these pictures because you'll then look at them, these videos more generously. <laughs> because um, if, when you start to think about our purpose in reconstructing a dance, um, and you start thinking about what I might, why I am doing it, then you are more generous when you're looking at other people's reconstructions. And you won't necessarily just damn them outright because, oh, they're not doing that, they're not doing this, or they're doing that. It looks funny. Um, because they may well have good reasons too. So I always feel perfectly happy looking, watching any dance when I can feel that I can, un I, un I see where they're coming from. I, I know why they're doing that. That's, that's an interesting solution, or that's a really good device. Because I know that they're trying to entertain and they're also trying to solve source problems at the same time and they're trying to keep close to the source while taking account of the floor and the time of night and a thousand other factors. Um, so when you look at this per our purpose, you have to look at what is the purpose of our reconstruction. When faced with several different descriptions of what seem to be essentially the same dance, are we trying to represent a possible original form of what may lie behind several different textual descriptions or are we trying to produce a dance which captures the most common form a dance might have taken? Uh, and when faced with several different interpretations of a text, <coughs> are we trying to create a dance which brings out themes which we believe were once believed to be central to the dance's identity, or are we trying to create a dance which gives us the best physical sensation? Or uh, for those dances which uh, would seem to have both a theatrical manifestation and an earlier social manifestation, are we trying to capture the form in which experienced dancers might express it or the form in which novices might find it accessible? What is the effect on my own view of what is possible? Um, I should come back one screen, shouldn't I? Uh, you can sometimes avoid uh, you can sometimes miss the original intention of a dance by approaching a reconstruction from too narrow a mindset. If you're always used to a particular dance form and you come across this reconstruction, you can sometimes have a temptation to interpret the figures in the light of your particular, that, that particular dance form. So that can be a problem. So it's good to understand your own um, background when you're looking at a dance to reconstruct. How detailed should my written or performed reconstruction be? To what extent do we try to reflect in, uh, in our steps and detail um, the character suggested by contemporary notation, notators and descriptions? And will this depend on whether we are reconstructing a dance in order to teach as a skill building exercise or in order to prepare for a display performance? Or in order to share socially with a group um, of people with different backgrounds? So should experienced dancers so sometimes be left to follow principles rather than a detailed template? And, and indeed, that's what people in the past, some dancing masters in the past assumed that experienced dancers would bring a certain, um, uh, certain variety to the dance. And indeed, how do we capture in our reconstruction that possibility for variation? And indeed, uh, 
the necessity for variation, which dancing masters once imagine, once imagine. Um, and in one, but we can only call a dance with one word, uh, one series of words. Is that not so? You can't. You, you don't want to say, "Oh, do this," or "Do that," or "You can do that." And and dancing masters are the same when they're describing. They tend to just have one sentence to describe something. But you can often see when it's not a special choreography that they've carefully crafted. You can, and if you step back, you can often see they're just offering that galliard variation as a possibility. And if you want to do a different area, if you're the only people galliarding and you're not teaching it to the other people there, maybe another variation would actually be just as acceptable to that dancing master. So these are things worth thinking about. Um, and then how do we accommodate uh, milieu differences? As I said before, we've got this uh, problem that a dance might be done differently in the court or in the town or in the country between different sorts of dancers. And there's so many different sorts of balls, even in one milieu, like in the town, are we imagining we're at uh, a dancing master's end of term party? Or are we imagining that we're at the mayor's ball and the mayor doesn't dance very well? And so we don't want to you know, go over the top. We're not trying to show off to our dancing master teacher, but we're, we're at the mayor's ball, so we've got to let him go first. Um, or an ambassador's party, or a private subscription series in the town. So every single area or milieu will have its own style. Um, and looking further inside these different scenarios, do we mean how the dance might be done by untutored dancers who are trying to put on graces, like country bumpkins who are trying to dance up above their station? Or are we trying to be aristocrats or well-tutored dancers who are trying to show that they can let down their hair and be wild, you see, <laughs> and almost get out of time? So you can come at it from different angles if you're trying to display, or even if you're on the floor dancing socially. Um, sometimes you can feel you can have fun in a set, uh, taking on different persona. In fact, how do we accommodate role play? Because there's role play all the way through uh, a social dance, is there not? That from the moment you ask someone to dance with your little offering of the hand and your bow, you're taking on a role that might be uh, out of the ordinary for you, because you're not going to do that at work. <laughs> you see, so um, and. You're adopting good deportment, which you might not naturally do when you're shopping. And you're flirting and farewelling people. So you're always unconsciously or consciously playing a role. Um, you're playing a lady or a gentleman. Good, and you're playing um, good company. Perhaps even you're playing a suitor, as in a lover. Uh, you're a member of a society that is simultaneously real and imagined. The role you've unconsciously stepped into uh, in a more time-condensed way um, involves finding ways to rise above your own self-consciousness, to improve yourself and to make those around you happy, which of course is the whole point. How do we suggest in our reconstruction the range of roles believed to be appropriate? You've got to bear in mind, you do have to have a, you have to, you are making judgments when you write down a dance instruction. And for example, to come back to that other point I made earlier about the purpose of the hand, ha handwriting, there's one very nice text I remember from an Inns of Court manuscript where the, where the writer described the galliard. And he described it as one, two, three, and one, two, three, four, and five. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> it was just to remind himself, I think. <laughs> And all those other times, people will say something very cryptic about a dance and then say, but this is best learnt by watching <laughs> <laughs> or learnt by, from someone else. Um, how do we reconstruct a social dance that might have been done on a theatre or stage? We've got all of those same problems. And are the dances of our reconstruction meant to continue in a current role? That is, uh, to be actors still in character or just ball attendees being themselves? Are the dancers meant to be assuming a new role or new persona or a new attire? For example, in Shakespeare plays, at the, there's always country dancers, are there not? Um, in the, between acts and particularly at the end, they'll say, uh, and you'll hit, see it in the stage directions, or someone will say, oh, here come the sickle men from the fields and the nymphs from the wood. 
okay? And then a dance will happen. Now, and maybe in the play, uh, the dancers are dressed like sicklemen, you know, people who've just been harvesting in the field or, or, or nymphs. And maybe they actually try to dance a little bit in that character. But those same dancers that were in plays became famous and the tunes were famous and they were put into social dance books, which everyone could then dance at, um, at their local uh, on, the, on the Friday evening. And, but you weren't going to be a sickleman or a nymph. Or were you? Because in a dance like uh, Les Sylphides, which is uh, a Danish dance, well, uh, yes, it is a Danish dance because the, the original uh, score and ballet was written in Paris, but a very famous Danish ballet master saw it in Paris, wanted to reproduce the whole play at, back in Copenhagen, but couldn't get the copyright. I you know, have to pay too much. So he decided, oh, I'll get my friend to write the music and I'll, I'll write a different ballet. And they did, but same sort of storyline, about uh, woodland nymphs in the wood and witches and things and it's a lot and it's one of their most famous ballets but people saw the ballet and they wanted to dance socially to the music so straight away as happened from 16th century Italy all the way through to the 19th century they cut the ballet music into social dance music and you can do a quadrille called Les Sylphides and when you hear the music for the fairies in the woods, all circling around, and when you have a figure where the ladies in the set are all circling, are you going to invite the ladies just to circle like this, or are you going to invite them to be nymphs of the wood? You see. So these are questions that even when you're reconstructing social dances that you might want to contemplate. Um, to how do we present our reconstruction so that it works for modern day participants and audiences? How necessary that is to think about. Uh, whether a dance is intended as one for everybody or a challenge just for half of the attendees or just a display out in front too. Because sometimes I, find, sometimes I myself find it's good just to put a display on which you've talked to some people beforehand, not necessarily to show off. None of us are... are, are I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not very theatrical or extrovert, but I do like people to think about dance and to see and to have their horizons continually broadened. So by showing something in the middle of the ball, something more challenging, um, I've been really pleased how in our own scene, we don't bore those people. Those people are happy to, everyone else is happy to sit down for a moment. Uh, we try to overlap it with a break while they've got their drink and we'll show something. And then they can see another style of dance in the middle of their party and it can widen their horizons. Um, so, so bringing something historical to life is not just about understanding the past, but also understanding the present and dancing not just the patterns for the feet, but also about experiencing experiences for the ears and the eyes and the brain and the heart, and about having an enjoyable physical, social, emotional, intellectual, aesthetic, communal experience while re relating to music, partner, and a group. How do we factor all these considerations into how we present our reconstructions on both the page when we try to write them down, like I've been trying in 10,000 pages? <laughs> and that's what it's reached. So I think that's a good point to make the last full stop. Um, uh, or on the floor when you put on a participatory dance. Uh, so these are the questions I, I leave you with. You've probably all thought of them at different times yourself. Um, and it certainly kept me busy and given me a lot of pleasure thinking about them for the last 30 years and putting together the notes, the reconstructions I, the, on those 1,000 dancers that are in that new dance series. Um, but, but I might leave you not with the books, although I will invite anybody interested in the books when, the, when that next and hopefully final edition comes out in... Uh, December, hopefully, Christmas, or maybe January, if I overshoot. Because there's always lots of technical problems at the end. Um, to leave an email with Alwyn uh, at the end, but uh, just she'll have a piece of paper there. Because I realize we've been having such a great time the last four weeks, and I haven't taken a single email from anybody. And I think, I'm going to be on that aeroplane thinking, how can I get back in touch with all those interesting people I was talking about? Alwyn tells me, 
I need to be on Facebook or have a blog or, <laughs> or not be a hermit like I have been for the last 20 years. And I keep promising when I finish the books, I will <laughs> stop being a hermit. But then it's too late, isn't it? I have to tell you about the book somehow. Maybe, I'll, maybe through Sampo, I'll be able to say when that edition's available. And I'm also revising, not The Lost Dancers, which is just standalone there. I'm revising my Christmas Carol dance books. I hope to have them available at the same time. And a little volume called Odd Delights that I produced 10 years ago. I'm updating and it has got some more Bordonian material in it actually so maybe that will be of interest um, but I'm going to be brave and uh, take questions from you for the last 20 minutes but also show glimpses of some of our balls just that one ball that we were lucky a gentleman was videoing and if I hit that button here is the Friday ball which is the and we started them I was so keen to stretch their geographic horizon since we had people from all around the country back to uh, the very earliest history of English country dancing, well, back to at least 1580. And we started with a ball, a dance from 1580. I'll move the cursor to the arrow. What you're seeing there is not a participatory dance. A, that's a still from a little mask dance. Who has heard of the mask as a, a cultural institution? Yes, a lot of has been written on masks. We've got a lot of music and librettos. It was a dance form, it was an entertainment form in England, sort of derived from the Italian uh, play sort of spectacle, and it involved dance. But we don't, everyone, the academics will always say we don't have any choreographies, and they're almost in England, but they're, they're not quite true because there is a choreography written in a merchant's diary and he composed a mask for, his, for a wedding that was to take place between two English people in Istanbul. And I got the diary and it had the music and it had all the dance and figures and we reconstructed it. So you could see a world first if you watch the whole of that. There, spring, summer, autumn, winter. But here we go, this is just the Friday. I'll, I'll see if I can fast forward. Oh no, we've jumped too far forward. I didn't do that right, I'll try again. Anything happening? Uh, I'm sorry, Sampo. Tomo uh, tomorrow, when we do the Bordonian talk, tomorrow afternoon, I'll, I'll have some other videos, uh, more with a Bordonian nature, people doing Bordonian dance. The history of England from the reign of Henry IV to the death of Charles I. Let's just let that run. We have to leave it Going Let forward. us now enjoy two dances from Tudor times. Get a bit, I'm in the
that's that's. I actually wrote this. Song. something fancy there. Can I just do it like that? Stop detecting. Sorry. You uh, you you do a, a, a you go like this behind your partner, <laughs> and they had a picture of a dancer dressed in Chinese style. You've got to remember Chinese influence in Europe at this time, and you know Brighton Pavilion in England, all that Chinese architecture. And then, but they make it meditations in that they, the music keeps stopping. But there's a reconstruction problem. You've got the score, and you can see that the music stops here and here, and you can do the play it like that. But when you present it, you don't want to give it all away at the first time. So you just play the music straight. And they do the dance straight. All the complicated figures. And then, the second time, you invite the musicians to play the pauses. And then the third time, you invite the musicians to do something that's not said in the score, which is to make the pauses wherever they like. <laughs> and it normally works absolutely fabulously, but if I show you the whole of this track, You'll see there was one little glitch. We had two fabulous pianists with us that weekend, and they both, I, I, in different cities, I'd led the student with both of them. I'd gone out to Hobart and met this other pianist, and she came up to join our ball, and they both wanted to do it. <laughs> and so we had them both on the piano. <laughs> and they had to both stop at the same time. <laughs> so, but they love that sass. And if we just finished the ball, where did we finish that evening? I'm not sure. Let's have a look at the next video. Um, but we normally go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Maybe you do too. The Saturday ball was the next one. We've got a minute to look at, a few minutes to look at. It's the next video frame after the purpose. That's the one. Yes. That says European flag dance because I actually wrote a, a dance to go to the European national anthem. But I'm sorry, I can't introduce you. I'm, I, I'm quite fond of the dance. We did it. We did it uh, at our festival. <laughs>
read. But one thing I forgot to write down from the source. Oh, we can probably write four, but there's only a brief bit. One thing I... We try to include uh, reenactors when they're available and keen to come along. And they did a lovely little... Two for the 40 seconds. It's handy to have them on the Everybody, or how much to rely on the natural nature of the dance, which involves a top couple coming down the line and letting the experience propagate. And so sometimes I find it's best not to over teach because then people expect you to teach everything. But if you just keep it just below complete satisfaction, then people will be ready to look and you can even advise people to. I try to, when we've got people from all around who've not danced before, I tell them the first thing is just to uh, listen to the call and watch the people above them coming down and use them. Uh, we can skip you. Just a little half an inch of the time. Oh, there's a nice pleasant little waltz there. Oh, we better skip the full force of that. Oh, that's a very, that's uh, from a manuscript from France, that one. This is a manuscript from Germany, a three-person dance, always useful. That's an American dance from the, outside, from the time. All four people in your mind are set, get ready to do lots of that stuff. Oh, there's a European flag dance. Unfortunately, the, I, the sound is, is just non-existent because the camera up on the balcony Skip on. Oh, this is the chest dance. Better let that run because I hope you'll all join me tomorrow. This is a rather heavy duty chess board. Um, I brought only our lightweight one, which is black and white, a bit too more traditional. It's, it, ah, oh, I'll have to explain more tomorrow. This is a beautiful, ah, uh, from France. Oh, there's a little berserker. Let's just leave that running. Um, uh, this is an example. Now, this is an interesting problem of dance reconstruction. Can we just pause for one moment? Just the Oh, there's the Battle of Waterloo we did on Wednesday. Just leave it there. But that other dance you saw a glimpse of... Um, was where they were doing a mazurka in a long way set. And how, yeah, I had a problem then because I was re reading a book which was published in Latvia in 1806 in German. And it had a se section on mazurkas and a section on English country dances and a section on the Ecossaise, Scottish dance, and on the Polonaise, all these different dance forms. I didn't actually give detailed descriptions of any particular dance, but at one point he mentioned uh, the author said, mentioned the fashion in Riga, or the fashion in that part of Europe, uh, to cross, to hybridize the mazurka with the English country dance. But he did not approve of it, <laughs> because he said there is not enough space in an in a English country dance column to use mazurka steps and figures. Uh, I, I, and he said, I've only seen the mazurka put into square sets. And you have lots of mazurka quadrilles, that is true. But what do you do when you're reading in a source that one of the big crazes was a cross between the mazurka and the English country dance and there's no instructions? <laughs> so I wrote a couple, <laughs> you see. And that's what you saw them doing, and they're, and they're very popular. And I actually taught them in Riga. 
I told them where they came from. I told them the truth. <laughs> uh, now here's the Battle of Waterloo if we let it run. Sideways. And hopefully we'll fill your ballroom with a simple little sequence. But you can get quite anxious waiting here. Like waiting for a battle. You know, you're, waiting. you're not sure if you're going to perform well. <laughs> this is just the beginning. I don't know how much is on this little clip, but um, I mentioned on Wednesday that when we did it uh, the first time, some oh, that was someone from the audience came up and said, uh, "You need to have casualties falling down." And the other dancer goes on top of them. Just a long way to dance. We can leave that to run. Oh, I know. This is a. Uh, I'll, I'll take that. Just observe. Sort of sort of see this dance? This is an 1800 dance that's very similar to the Bure Assis Passage we did on Wednesday, and that we'll do this afternoon. So there's 200 years difference, and all very similar dance, just the footwork that's different. If you skip to the Sunday, while you skip to the Sunday, ready to play five minutes of that, yes, uh, 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 throw. Just uh, to clarify, uh, I think you were going somewhere uh, on a point that uh, something you didn't write down somewhere, but I'm not sure if you got to that point yet. Ah. What I didn't write down, that's right. I didn't write down the source where I read. Hmm, where I read. Now, what was that? <laughs> um, well, there's only. What was I saying at that point? Oh, I'll, have to, I'll have to watch the tape, won't I? <laughs> Something I didn't write down, and now I've even forgotten. And there's only two things I have. Uh, read and not written down, and I've regretted it, and I haven't been able to find them again to put into my books. And that was one of them, and, and now you'll want to know the other, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> the other was I read somewhere in a period source that um, a gen uh, somebody, and I don't know where they were, they said he'd been to a ball and he saw a man, it was 19th century, he saw a man dancing Oh, I think it was in America, and I don't know where the man had came from, but he was in America. He said he saw a man dancing with a lady with an ungloved hand. It must have been a formal ball, because you don't always have to wear gloves, but this must have been. He said, and he said, that is taking democracy too far. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know where it was. And I don't, I've forgotten the other one, but when I remember, I'll write to you, Arthur. <laughs> um, just a little bit of the Sunday. Any other questions while we're, while we're gearing up for sun, uh, the Sunday ball is Victorian era, 1820s onwards. Yes? Have, have you documented your process of reconstructing some particular dance, like where you had to make interpretations with sources? Which sources? Yes. Yes, I, I try to use everything. I try to get every source before I even start. Um, I try to get literary allusions. Um, uh, newspaper clippings referring to that dance and then I will try to piece together and see if I've got one consistent version or multiple versions and then I start to have to I then I identify the problems there might be some problems with uh, what happens here or um, before I even start thinking of solutions. And then I only start thinking of options for solutions. Don't jump straight to thinking of a solution. Always, I always try to think of all the different options for solutions. And uh, then um, I'll, I might try s some set of options for solutions on my dance group. Uh, and I might say I could be doing this, but I'm just going to try out this sis to see. And I'm, I'm often watching them. And at the end, uh, they might have really enjoyed it, but I have made a mental note. I don't like something because it's unnatural, or maybe I need this other option. I'll and next week, I'll try the other option on them. And they start to figure out I'm changing the dance. <laughs> and they have a soccer rule that first time I change it, I get a yellow card. Second time, I get a red card. So I've got to be careful. What happened is I just started three different groups. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alan? Um, you've actually documented 
um, your decisions in the books, though. Oh, absolutely. That's why I have so many notes. I, I put all the options at different points in my notes and which options you might want to go to in different circumstances. And you might even, when you want to then take the dance into a school situation, you might want to make another compromise again, something different. So yes, I always talk aloud. I've been talking to my books for 20 years. Not, not on Facebook, but just I talk to my library and my books. Thank you. Uh, shall we, any other question? Oh, we've got it ready. Just have a few minutes of this one, because this is 100 years, well, 60 years later. Oh, we made it a masquerade. Thank you. There we go. And we can jump forward. Beautiful music. I think the sound is getting a bit better at the recording. sounding quadrilles, but we'll have to get to the end of the evening and you'll see how boisterous we can get. Of course, and we can jump forward. Dun, ba, da, 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 da. Yep. Full circle of A. This is that Swedish dance. Uh, oh, Danish dance. Jump forward again. Everyone's looking fine because we want to see the, uh, the development of the world. again. They're showing every figure of that quadrille. Sometimes in the shorts. And bounce as a group. I think jump forward. Out. In. Out. Because these people are not as good as these people are. <laughs> up at the other end. And left for the men. Turn the opposite right. Left for the men. One thing, one short answer to the recurring question of what to do and when and how to do something. Everything in reverse. To do what you think they did then. Because they It's going to be the men who go in back to back to all and the women who go different in. sorts of dances. And they would consciously say, we'll have the uh, include slower ones at the beginning. So four counts for each day across. Cross two, as they three, go and sit down, you have the more boisterous four dances. Four you do it naturally, four, but they did it there. Oh, that one's interesting, but never mind. Every, every dance is interesting and tells a big story, really, but we should talk, talk about it for weeks. Slip to the left, circle for 16. They've focused on one group just a little bit. Don't go too far forward because I want to get the last few dances. Oh, OK, leave that, leave that. We have the volume on the music. Right shoulder across the set. Yeah, uh, have you heard, you know the quad, the standard shoulder. Uh, quadrille français, or first and set from the early 19th century. A standard quadrille. They kept putting it to different, different music. But it actually was the origin of the can-can. And people in the public dance halls on the left bank of Paris did the dance, but they did it with exaggerated Four movements and balances. We had one man at one point when he had to do the Cavalier Sword, the solo gentleman of the slave. Um, I'd showed people pictures, talking about pictorial evidence, pictures of people dancing in these public dance halls in Paris. It's in one of my volumes, all there for you. And if you show it to your students, you can give them ideas. And I showed them, and there's the man in the middle of the set doing a handstand. And we had a gentleman doing a very dramatic beautiful in the middle of the dance. Not yet. Now you can circle him. Now, <laughs> you can always invite people to improvise. I'm always keen to let people rise up to their um, level of exhibitionism and competency. Cotillion dance games. Now this is a, a big craze. I think we need to pause there. We need to pause there. Uh, pause with the soccer, because we've only got a minute left. Um, this is a, my, makes a good point. Uh, in the late 19th century, they well from about 1830s, 40s onwards in Europe, they started to develop. Uh, they started to put dance games into formal balls. Well, less than formal balls, not the most formal, into the more casual balls. And they started off publishing a book with maybe 40 dance games you can do. And then 
uh, in the next, over the next 50 years, the 40 went to 1,000. And I collect dance books. I've got a book with 1,000 of these dance games. And they started to introduce more and more and more props. Not, not, they started with innocent things like fans and you know, uh, a scarf or something. And then you end up having to get toys. And in Paris and in New York, there were shops devoted to accessories for <laughs> dance games so you could have the a best hit. Now, this tradition goes back to Renaissance times. And it probably continued underneath the, the radar of the dancing masters. It was beneath their dignity to talk about it. <laughs> and they didn't, so they didn't. But um, you, you can glimpse them in Renaissance texts and in other texts later on, but it came to the fore in the public. And I, I'd recently, before this ball, I take, took delivery of some sheet music um, called, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but anyhow, it had instructions for a dance game that involved a football. <laughs> and I thought, I've never done that one. That sounds good. So we, we debuted it there, and it went quite well. Um, so, but I might not have actually understood the context unless I'd understood that there was this dance game tradition. So that's why it always understands things in the broadest context possible. And... Uh, if you do that, when you do dance games, um, I myself make the, put the simplest one first and then get more and more busy. And I try to make one flow to the other and become more and more promiscuous and naughty. And I thought this was just me, always going to be <laughs> naughty at the end, you know? And then I discovered in the 19th century, a person wrote in his dance book, which he put his games, he said, it's good to group them in little sessions so you don't have to all go back to your seats and in, in this way and to get busier and busier. And so I thought, isn't that nice? So maybe sometimes go with your instincts. Maybe that's a good point to finish. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, everybody, and Alan. The last page has our contact, our, where we are. Oh, thank you very much. If, if people want to follow us, um, and talk to John further, um, we're on the website has our email address. The Facebook is me at the moment because John hasn't finished his book. <laughs> <laughs> but I do carry on email conversations, so please do write to me, make me feel not alone, or leave an email contact there. And, or catch me over the weekend and we can talk more dance. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs>